Good morning and welcome to worship with New Life Metropolitan Community Church on this Sunday morning, this seventh Sunday of Eastertide and what we know as Ascension Sunday. Oh, gracious God, creator of us all, we give you praise and thanks today. Find us and all of our wanderings through this week and give us calm, give us a sense of of being loved and sharing that love. We praise you for all that you are and all that you make it possible for us to be as well. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I invite you to join us for our gathering call today. It was uploaded to Facebook last night. Should have been in your emails from yesterday as well. Jeff, if you'll start us out. Our holy God lives forever in the highest heavens, and this is what God says. Though I live high above in a holy place, Aunque viva en la o alta del lugar santo, I also live with people who are broken, oppressed, and humble. También vivo con personas quebrantados, oprimidas y humildes. I am here for those who depend on me, giving them new life and a lifted spirit. Estoy aquí para aquellos que dependen de que yo les dé nueva Vida y un espíritu elevado. May God bless this reading and the hearing of the Holy Scriptures as we continue in worship together. with New Life Metropolitan Community Church. It's been nice to have some weather that didn't just go from winter to summer to have that in between and sort of roller coaster up and down a little bit. And wherever you've been this week, no matter who you are or how you self-identify or with whom you love or however you are in, in your own life, know that God's Spirit finds us and connects us, even virtually, as we're looking forward to hopefully sooner rather than later being back in person all together. We'll talk more about that. Just a few things to remind us as we go into the week of things that are happening today and throughout the week. Uh, at 1230 today on Zoom, we have a very important congregational forum. Uh, we'll be talking and giving you an update on our capital campaign. We'll be looking from and hearing from our board and our treasurer about our finances for first quarter. Uh, and we'll also be talking about uh, what it means and what we can expect is a lot of things have changed pretty fast this week. And yet we want to still make sure that as we address all the challenges that we have before us, 
uh, that we are safe in doing so and yet get us back to where we can some sense of normalcy, whatever that's going to be. I think that's going to be a grand day when we can just feel like we can relax a little bit because the last year has been challenging, certainly. But I believe God's also been at work teaching us some things, too, maybe helping us and reflect this week on, you know, how what have we learned and how are we different, perhaps, now as we come back together. Uh, this afternoon, I remind you that the FEMA clinic, if you haven't gotten a vaccine and still want to get one, you can do so through the 22nd down at the old Macy's at Military Circle Mall. The 22nd, I understand, is the last day there. They're shifting other uh, opportunities and options for you uh, to other locations. So you can get them in various pharmacies or different locations. And so it's still never too late if you haven't gotten that vaccine yet. On Tuesday of this week, our Discovery and Conversation group on racism, it's a monthly group that meets once a month. Uh, they'll be meeting again on uh, 7 o'clock on Tuesday. The questions will, are at, in the What's Happening that was emailed to you and at the end of What's Happening. If you'd like to get a heads up and feel free to, to join that group, even if you haven't been before, it's a good time. It's a very important things, especially in the way our world is today. As we examine ourselves, as we talk about how we can make ourselves better, but also encourage each other and maybe even in a positive challenge with each other along the way as well. On Wednesday evenings, Wednesday evenings on Zoom at 6.30, if you just want to check in, visit a little bit, say a prayer together, and then at 7 o'clock, uh, we begin the Clobber the Passages book study that we've been doing. Uh, Reverend Jim and Tony will be leading that discussion this week. Uh, so that's at uh, 7 o'clock on Wednesday evening. If you haven't gotten the book, that's okay. You can still join the discussion. Uh, it is still available on Amazon. There's a 99-cent version uh, on, for Kindle as well. Again, just a reminder that this afternoon at uh, 1230 that we'll start that congregational forum on Zoom. If you don't have that link, reach out to us. Again, it was sent out to you earlier in the week. It was also in what's happening uh, that was emailed to you yesterday. I've got another announcement coming up. We're about halfway through May. Uh, Memorial Day is going to be coming up in a couple of weeks. The first Wednesday evening in June, we're going to return to Wednesday evenings on the beach. Can I hear amen to that? Amen. If you don't know what that is, basically we gather right down here on the bay, on the be in the be on on the beach, not in the beach. Uh, you don't have to go in the water, but just pull up a, a beach chair. We visit about 6:30 until it gets dark. Uh, it's just a time to be able to get together and share prayer or just uh, fellowship and be together and visit if you'd like. So Wednesday evenings on the beach will start the Wednesday after Memorial Day. That is uh, the first Wednesday in June. Let's take just a moment and say thank you, God. Thank you for the gift of life and of love and of being able to share that in these journeys as we go together. We're ever so thankful and mindful that sometimes we get caught up in all the stresses of life, be it at work, be it at school, be it at play, be it in relationships, at church and other places, that sometimes maybe we miss even the small things to be thankful for. And in this moment today, we open our hearts and minds, our spirit to your spirit in a way that you not only can connect with us, but help us to begin to transform into the people that you continue to call us to be and to be about the things that you want us to do to give you praise and glory. And all God's people said, amen. Let's continue in song. Yeah. 
This fall, Metropolitan Community Church presence and ministry here in Hampton Roads will mark a 44-year milestone. Throughout Metropolitan Community Churches and also especially here in Hampton Roads, we always like to say that everyone is a minister because there are things. I may be called to serve in the role of a pastor and an ordained clergy person in Metropolitan Community Churches, but all of us carry around the spirit of Christ with us and there are folks that you can, re you can reach that I could never reach because of my clergy collar or status and all that. It takes all of us. And yet in Metropolitan Community Church tradition, we also honor and hold to account those of us who say that we're called to vocational and professional ministry. And through those almost 44 years now, a lot of folks have come in and through our Metropolitan Community Church here in Hampton Roads and have entered ordained and have been ordained and entered professional clergy and ministry, not just here in Hampton Roads, but all across the land. And so we honor that tradition today. Uh, Rhonda Thorne has been serving with us for the last two years. It seems like it uh, was only yesterday and a lot of health challenges that Rhonda had, but even in spite of that, she was still able to rise to the occasion uh, and to minister to us, allow us to minister to her, and it has been a wonderful journey. Today marks the completion of Rhonda's internship with us, and we're going to do a special blessing and pray that modern technology allows us to bring her live on the screen from Roanoke, where she lives. Uh, and so we'll do that in just a moment as the choir sings of an appropriate song, The Servant Song. Good morning, Rhonda. Good morning. Good morning. We can hear you both. I see Christine is there with you all the way from Roanoke, and so far technology is blessing us yeah. and allowing us to be able to connect together. Wow, what a journey it has been. It feels like in some ways only yesterday, and we are so proud of you, and we are delighted that we've been able to share. I'm looking at the screen where I'm seeing myself. I should be looking up here at you. <laughs> I joked with Rhonda that I was going to be able to lay hands on her this way, but I feel like a weatherman doing the wrong thing. <laughs> Rhonda, you have risen to the occasion so many times with the challenges that have been thrown at you health-wise and just uh, the distance of having to travel down here, um, but we could not be more delighted to be with you today in this journey. And what we want to do, and this past week, um, her covenant team and Tony Crisp, uh, Betty Ambrose, uh, and Linda Hardy, along with Reverend Ka Catherine Houchins, who's our pastor at MC's The Blue Ridge in Roanoke, have served, along with myself, as Rhonda's covenant team. We met with Rhonda this past uh, Thursday, and each of them shared their letters that they've written in recommendation, and that I'm going to read portions of the 
uh, cover letter that I'll send to the denomination, giving our blessings for Rhonda to go further in this journey. And this has been written, uh, this and will go out today. Uh, it is my pleasure to be able to share with you that Rhonda Thorne has successfully completed the internship portion of her readiness for vocational ministry journey. Rhonda has served as an MCC intern with our congregation of New Life Metropolitan Community Church of Hampton Roads, Virginia since May of 2019. During her tenure with us, we have seen tremendous emotional and spiritual growth take place in Rhonda's life despite or perhaps even because of the equally tremendous challenges she has faced both, both with her own personal health and as we have all tried as best we could to figure out as best we knew how to be and do church in the middle of a pandemic. First, let me say from what we have all seen here, Rhonda, that your call and commitment to ministry is unwavering and is born out of everything that we have come to know and love about you. Our joint purpose and goals with Rhonda were not to check off required boxes for ordination, but to provide her with a full ministry immersion experience, allowing her participation and access to virtually all puns intended in this new virtual age, everything we do here at New Life MCC. It has been our intention and hope that the experience she has gained during her time with us would help prepare you, Rhonda, in ways that we aren't taught in seminary and all too often aren't exposed to or challenged by until we're in the thick of realness and rawness of ministry. During her time with us, we have seen Rhonda rise to these positive challenges, rise to these positive challenges in ways that have met and often exceeded our expectations. Guided by her strong foundational faith and sense of calling, we, her covenant team and myself, are in total agreement that we have seen Rhonda grow and develop not only spiritually and emotionally, but in the practical, everyday, relational with people application sense, which we all know is so vital to one's long-term effectiveness in ministry. Rhonda, we have all the confidence in your passion, compassion, commitment, openness to both the people and the Spirit's continued presence and work in your life, and those with whom you will be called to share the journey, that you will make a positive difference in both the name and the Spirit of Christ. Today, and I want to say this to you too, Rhonda, and you and I have had this conversation before, just because you're completing and we're going to offer you a blessing, and this isn't a, a blessing we're going to take back, but you also need to know that no matter where you are, that this is still a home base for you. And we join, we join with the folks at MCC of the Blue Ridge because that's where you are physically located, but we know you're always emotionally and spiritually connected with us here, and we're always here for you. Will you join me now in good MCC fashion? Don't put your hands up like this, but put your hands out even if you're at home like you're going to hug Rhonda at this point. Rhonda, I'll try to do this around the camera. How about that? I'm going to hold my hand up here and just pray for you in this moment. Make sure you come back up on the screen the right way. <laughs> Gracious God, we are so thankful to have been able to share this portion of Rhonda's journey and Rhonda, we are excited that you have not only shared the journey with us, but you have become part of us. Know that you are loved by God, you're empowered by God, and as we often say, that God is not only behind you, beside of you, but ahead of you in this journey. We claim that presence and promise for you today, and for all those to whom you're going to be called to walk the journey with. As you go, know that you have clay feet and those with whom you are with have clay feet. We are all human, but God's Spirit has given us the position of being able to be called a child of God. Go now with our blessings to all that lies ahead and all God's people said, Amen. We will hold the Christ light for each other as we continue in this journey.
Rhonda, before we let you go off the screen, I'd like to give you an opportunity if there's something you'd like to say to us at this time. Well, there's so much that I want to say. I am blessed beyond measure. I, I, I just, I thank God for each of you. I thank you for your love and your guidance and your patience for the nudges the pushes for the hugs and the prayers and everything during this journey. I, I've shared with you, Pastor Mark, and the covenant team, and I, and I want to share with the church that I'm not the same person I was when I started this journey. And it's because of you. And I thank God for that, and I can only hope that in my ministry, I can hopefully even have the blessing to folks that you have been to me. Thank you for your love and support. Thank you. Thank you, Rhonda. We love you. Today, as we have every Sunday since Easter, we have also gone into a special Eastertide call to prayer and action. So much has been happening this past week around us. If you think back to all the scare about whether or not we're even going to have gasoline to come to church today or not. But it's not just here locally that things are happening. There's so much tension in the world whether it's around race or around gender or ethnicity. And today and this week especially, our hearts and minds uh, and then we hurt in our souls for the people of Israel and Palestine. And our pastor at uh, MCC of Toronto, uh, Reverend Jeff Rock, wrote something and put on Facebook that I thought was very, very appropriate for today. And I want to share this with you. Reverend Jeff wrote, as a faith leader far removed from the Israel-Palestine conflict, I'm often afraid to wade into the powder keg that is millennia long. But what I do know is this. I support Jews. I support Muslims. I support Israelis. I support Palestinians. I support peace. I support love. I do not support violence. I do not support anti-Semitism. I do not support Islamophobia. I do not support terrorism. I do not support using innocent people as human shields. I do not support the breaking of human rights. I do not support the breaking of the Geneva Convention. I do not support hate in any form. I do support peace talks, and I do live in hope and believe that peace is possible. I've heard from many friends of Jewish, Israeli, and Palestinian backgrounds this week that they are truly terrified right now as violence continually escalates. Pray with me, folks, please. I really do believe in the power of prayer and that we need to let the world know we believe peace is possible. Sometimes, perhaps, and we often need to call ourselves to action beyond prayer, but let's also not underestimate the power of prayer when we can't be there physically ourselves. In our hearts and minds, to the depth of our soul, may we connect with our brothers and sisters in the Middle East in a way that somehow God's Spirit in the miracle and mystery of life can bring peace to that land and the violence will stop. Will you join me as we pray together silently? And I invite you to pray. And, you know, God is a God of many names. And if you're listening today and you're comfortable, however you're comfortable relating to God, may you claim this prayer promise and presence of God for our people that we know are in conflict today. O oh God, our God, creator of us all, hear our prayers, O oh Lord.
Today we continue to join our hearts and minds not only for prayers of people across the world, but also to share praises and concerns with each other. Take a moment and feel free to write your comments on Facebook Live. And if it's a thanks or a praise or a concern that you'd like to, our prayer and intercessory group continue to lift up those prayers through the week and we commit to praying with you. And know that God is already at work in and around us and in the lives and in the situations about which we pray. I want to ask you in particular, I know that Joey is with his mom and dad. He's usually here as part of our worship team, but his dad has had several heart procedures this week, and we continue to lift up his dad and Joey's families in our prayers today as well. Uh, this morning, my dad's sister, my Aunt Bessie, is probably right now in surgery. Uh, she's in her mid-90s uh, having surgery after broken her hip this week. So I'd ask you to remember my Aunt Bessie and my family as well. My mom's usually logged on. She's probably, they were going to the hospital this morning. So uh, please keep my family. Indeed, I know you have other folks that you'd like to list. You can go to our webpage and click on the prayer tab and leave a prayer that way. You can send a text or reach out to us an email or instant message. We'll hold those things that you ask us to in confidence and other things that you say it's okay to share. We will share them with the purpose that we join many of us together holding up your thanks and praises today. Again, will you pray with me silently, and then I'll give voice to our prayers. O oh God, our God, Creator, sustainer and savior of us all. As you connect with us and those times maybe that we don't know how to pray or can't even pray, that your spirit already knows what we're feeling and those are lifted into your presence. We claim that promise from scripture today, not only for ourselves, but for those who are struggling, those who are challenged, those who need healing. And sometimes healing, we need physical, emotional, spiritual, mental healing, all those wrapped up into one. As you give us the wherewithal we need to live into wholeness. We indeed pray for peace not only across our world, but in our own inner selves, in our own relationships. And as we prepare to regather at some point, oh God, give us wisdom and discernment that we can connect in ways and that we can learn the lessons that you have wanted us to learn during this time of waiting, in this time of that seems so long that we haven't been able to connect together. But we are ever so thankful that no matter whether we are together physically, that you connect us with your spirit. Today, we offer all these things in your holy name. Hear our prayers, O Lord. And all God's people said,
chapter 1, verses 1 through 12. Theophilus, I first wrote to you concerning everything Jesus did and taught from the beginning, right up to the day when he was taken up into heaven. Before he was taken up, working in the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus instructed the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed them that he was alive with many convincing proofs. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days, speaking to them about God's kingdom. While they were eating together, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what God had promised. He said, This is what you heard from me, John baptized with water, but in only a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. As a result, those who had gathered together asked Jesus, Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel now? Jesus replied, It isn't for you to know the times or seasons that God our Creator has set by God's own authority. Rather, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. After Jesus said these things, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud hid him from their sight. While he was going away, and as they were staring up into the sky, suddenly two men in white robes stood next to them. They said, Galileans, why are you standing here looking into the sky? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way that you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. May God bless this reading and the hearing of the Holy Scriptures as we worship today. You know, this past week, it was um, quite a sight, wasn't it, as we saw lines at gas stations. And for those of us who were, I should say those of us generically, I wasn't quite there yet, but for those of us who were twenty in our 20s in the 70s and are now 70s in the 20s, uh, maybe it brought back the memories of those gas lines back in the 1970s. Last year, it was toilet paper and paper towels. And isn't it amazing how the things that we want and the things that we need suddenly become into more focus. And when we have to do without something, it really does maybe make us more fond of two-ply toilet paper and worry that we're going to have to go to one ply or we even have it at all from this past year. Maybe the same can be said about church, that we've had to look at church in a new way. We didn't, I don't like the term we closed. We didn't close. We just had to do church in a different way. But yet, there's that deep ache inside of us to want to go back to being able to share in person with someone. And I think that's God's relationship with us. God wants to share that in person with us. And again, it makes us think about the things we want and the things we need and how we see our faith life. Is it something we want? Is it something we need? Is it both hand in glove together? Years ago, we lived out in the country and when I got my driver's license at 16 and I'd be going to town to do something and I'd stop by my granny who lived next door and I'd say, Granny, do you, do you need something or do you want something? She said, did you say, do I need it or do I want it? Right. And sometimes we have to ask God's discernment to help us know the difference. And it's okay when it's both. But as we think about all that God is calling us to do, may that guide us in ways that lead us to make more of a difference than we ever have as I mentioned earlier, we're coming up later this year on 44 years. May this year coming up be the most impactful year, not only in our lives, but in our presence and ministry here in Hampton Roads. This morning, I invite you to give, and you give in different ways. I thank you for your compassion and your passion and your generosity as you give to the general fund that helps keep us just operating in general and we're going to look forward. We budgeted for this year as if we were going to be in a nor quote, normal year, and we haven't been yet, but that may begin to change. And so we're going to be looking forward and rethinking some of those ministries that we want to get back into the community about. And thank you for continuing to support our capital campaign. We'll hear an update on that at the Congregational Forum when we talk about that as well, because that is so important as we think through this year and balancing that out so we don't go too far one way or the other. Thank you for asking for God's discernment in your life and in your giving. I invite you to give as God's Spirit leads you to give. You can go to our website, newlifemcc.net. Click on the giving tab, the little tab will drop down, and you can give there in any way that you'd like. And also, you can drop things in the mail or to the mailbox in the front floor of the church. Thank you for who you are and for continuing to allow God's Spirit to lead you in your giving as well. Oh, 
Would please join us in singing that song. our thanks today for the blessings that you have bestowed upon this church today, God. Allow God uh, for us to further use all you give us, God, to you give you glory. And we ask all these things in your son's name. Amen. Amen. As our worship team comes down again, I want to thank them for their faithfulness and commitment over this past year. And, you know, as we have learned some of the things about being able to connect with each other virtually and how we look on camera or not, and I joke about Photoshopping my chin and my belly. Today, James, I've got mask envy. I don't know if you caught James's mask or not, but oh my goodness. James, come back up here and show everybody your mask if you didn't see that. Talk about bling on the mask. I'll come back there. All right. Thanks, Sarah. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Sarah, for that. All right. Now you can be seated. <laughs> well, how many of us have ever wished for more time with a loved one that we've lost? I would dare say most of us at one time or another have lost with the possible exception of when we have sat with and, and seen someone that we love suffer and, and we are ready at that point to let them go because we know that they're no longer suffering in this physical body. But yet even then, our hearts sometimes ache and grieve in ways that we feel like no matter how long or short we've had time, that it was never enough. And I know there was a movie sometime back that uh, Queen Lativa played in. Her character was named Georgia, and she got word that she was diagnosed with a terminal illness and that it was really close for the time. It's like 30 days or so is all she, they told her she had left. She decided she was going to spend those 30 days. She cashed out everything, and she went to Europe to this posh luxury hotel. And, oh, my goodness, it's quite, if you haven't seen the movie, go watch it, Last, last Holiday. And I wonder how many of us sometimes, if that were to be us, what will we do in those 30 days? Now, in the end, she gets a call, of course, and finds out that she was misdiagnosed, and it really wasn't her, it was somebody else. And I'm thinking, well, I'd be mad I'd spent all my money by that time. Well, the story that Jeff read from Acts today um, reminds us that more time, whether they were expecting it or not, more time was exactly what Jesus' followers received and what they got. I don't think they really were expecting it. Uh, this ascension story reminds us, especially as we read both Luke and Acts, and most folks feel like they were connected perhaps probably by the same author. Uh, in the first book, he says, from the first book until now, in this second writing after uh, that was written, they tell me the theologians and the historians say that the scrolls that would have contained this would have been at least, for Luke and for Acts, would have been at least 25 feet long. That's a long sermon. <laughs> I can tell you how many pages are, are going to be for 15, 20 minutes, and you all say, can we get it to 10? Yes. And so the author of Luke and Acts writes to whoever this person is, Theophilus. Now, that word actually means, guess what, friend of God. So whoever Theophilus was, so it could be to any of us. But this story holds several surprises in Luke and in Acts for those early followers of Jesus. Even though Jesus spent a lot of time preparing them for what was going to happen, they're still surprised. Now, that sounds a lot like us in a lot of ways. And if we look in John's gospel especially, we see that Jesus spent a lot of time. And I'll just really quickly run through some of the things that Jesus said to them, trying to prepare them for what was next. Uh, in the 13th chapter, during uh, the supper, Jesus, knowing that God had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God, he says, I'm going back to God. 
And so he was sort of preparing them for what was going to happen. He, they didn't really know how to read between the lines, I suppose. This one of my favorite passages is, Don't let your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. And if I go and prepare a place, I'll come back for you. It'll be a place for you too. And so I think he really was trying to prepare them in so many ways. Where you can go and read all of those middle chapters of the Gospel of John. <laughs> this is one of my favorites, though, in addition to the prepare a place for me. I, I guess I like that one, too. Remember, um, what was the, the, one of the first uh, read decorating household things? What was that? Uh, trading places. Trading Places was one of the first ones that came out. There's been a slew of them since then. But also in John 16, I like this. A little while, now listen to how this reads. A little while and you will no longer see me. And again, a little while and you will see me. Some of his disciples then said to one another, what's this thing he's telling us? A little while and you won't see me. And again, in a little while you're going to see me again. It almost feels like he's playing some cosmic shell game. You know, now you see me, now you don't. But he was trying, I think, to prepare them. But it wasn't just for the ascension we're talking about today. The first surprise, even though he had, you know, led them down this path, that Jesus was crucified. Think about how shocked they were and how much trauma, even though, of course, that's true as we grieve, too, with folks that we know are going to pass. As we sit with folks with terminal illnesses, we can, no matter how much we think we prepared ourselves and we grieve along the way, it still doesn't prepare us for that exact moment, does it? But they were surprised at the crucifixion. Second, they were surprised that he was, he was resurrected. <laughs> you know, a little while you're not going to see me, and then you're going to see me again. Well, he, I told you, he would have said to them. Third time, though, he's not only risen, but he's back, and he's eating, and he's drinking, and he's talking, and he's teaching to us. And then I'm not so sure that they were prepared for this fourth surprise that we talk about today where he suddenly was gone again and taken up from them into heaven. Talk about a, a spiritual, emotional roller coaster. Oh, my goodness. In that very relatively short period of time, wow, I don't know. I know how I would have felt. Maybe you can imagine how you would have felt, too. And in the middle of all this, how many times did Jesus actually ascend? Now, I don't think it was the folks of that day that I think it's our Monday morning quarterback theologians that asked that question today. But if you think about all this stuff, was it a spiritual ascension? Was it a physical ascension? You know, to the thief on the cross, Jesus said what? Today, you'll see me in paradise. Well, okay, that's one place. And then remember, uh, as he dies, actually in the process, right before he dies, he says, into your hands. I commit my spirit this moment. And we remember the words of Mary. He said to Mary at the tomb, I like to paraphrase it this way. It says, don't cling on to me, but I like to say, don't touch me, don't touch me, Mary. <laughs> I've not yet what? I've not yet ascended. So we got all this back and forth. And what are we to make of all this? I'm not so sure that we need to. I think that perhaps we need to focus on perhaps what really matters. Now, we think, well, when, and I say to you this in all seriousness, and we ask all these questions, you'll hear me probably say this again before the time is up today, that we have all these questions I'm going to ask when I get to heaven. I think when we get to heaven, we're going to be in so much awe. We're going to be so wonderstruck. It ain't going to matter, those questions that we had now. Now, I'll tell you a funny story about this ascending and where Jesus was between the crucifixion and the resurrection and the ascension. For those of, of you who grew up uh, in a high church tradition, perhaps your, part of your church liturgy was the Apostles' Creed. Any of you grow up saying the Apostles' Creed? I see some of you that did. Well, I grew up low church Baptist, and so, you know, we didn't believe in them creeds, you know. We, you just want to be saved. That was all the language that was used back then. Well, when I left seminary two years into a three-year program, and I gave myself the freedom to go visit the Frozen Chosen, First Presbyterian Church in Raleigh. Well, guess what? They said the Apostles' Creed, and I was so proud of myself. The, the pastor of the church at the time was uh, Dr. Edwards, and he was Scottish. And one day he knew I had come from the Baptist seminary. He said to me one day, he said, Mark, the only difference between a Baptist and a Presbyterian is a Presbyterian is a Baptist with a drinking problem. 
And I looked back at him, and in my Scottish brogue, I said, no, Dr. Edwards, a Baptist is a Presbyterian who hides his drinking problem. So. But I was so proud of myself for learning the Apostles' Creed and knowing it by memory. I can't do it today by memory, but I did back then. I went back home to the Presbyterian Church, and I wanted to impress my friends. And so, and you may, James, you may know it. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended it where? Into hell. And on the third day, he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven. So all this... What they didn't tell me was that some Presbyterian church used that phrase, he descended into hell, and some don't. So here I go back home to impress all my friends. They're not a descended into hell church. But guess who belted it out right in the middle of God's frozen chosen back home? He descended into hell. Yeah, they're thinking, yep, yeah, the hellfire and brimstone Baptist is still in that boy. That's what they were thinking back then. Truth of the matter, again, it really doesn't matter all of those things, does it? So we ask ourselves, what is it that really does matter? And again, I say to you, I don't think we should be too surprised when we get to heaven that maybe the things that the old preacher said to me one time, a lot of things we've been wrapped around here on earth ain't going to count for a hill of beans when we get to heaven. Personally, I'm not so sure that this story, this account in Acts, is even a story about heaven. I'm not even so sure it's a story that focuses or should focus as much about even Jesus coming back as sometimes we hear, especially in evangelical and hellfire and brimstone services, as much as it is what was right before those disciples and what's right before you and I today. The question, why are you standing here looking up into the sky? And then when I heard that and read that again, it made me think back to what Jesus said to Mary at the tomb, why do you seek what? The living among the dead. And so maybe this was a wake-up call for these disciples. And, and remember, when Mary was at the tomb, there was, in one account, she's encountering Jesus. In another account, and I think that's the one where they ask her where she was seeking the living among the dead, there were two individuals that were there with gleaming robes. In this account, the disciples are looking up into heaven. They've just seen Jesus go out of their sight, and there are two people in gleaming white or bright robes. I don't know what color they were. They might have been multicolored. It was like lightning, one translation says. But I think what's important is not what was there. What was important is that they were reminded in that moment that they had clay feet. They were reminded to be grounded they had just spent, Jesus had given them 40 days of extra bonus time. Who would have imagined? Imagine if we had that with somebody that we love. Imagine if we had that 40 day just closeness with Jesus. What Jesus would want to say to us. What we would want to say to Jesus in that moment. Reminded in those 40 days of who Jesus was. Perhaps they were reminded in those 40 days of who they were knowing Jesus. Maybe that's what's important for you and I as we walk around. Are our heads up in the clouds? Do we need to focus and look down, not just down and not see, but look around, not just down, but around to see the folks that are around us? And Jesus was taken out of their sight, and they were shocked and surprised. Yes, we would have been too. Let's not be too hard on them. We would have been really shocked. And we'd have probably been standing there with our mouths gaping open too. Why are you standing here looking? What are you and I looking at? Maybe especially as we come back and think about regathering. Is that we think about are we looking and seeing what's really important? Someone said it this way. In the rush to return to normal, let us use this time to consider which parts of normal are worth coming back to. Pretty good advice, I would say. And they were told, not only in this passage, but they were told not to leave Jerusalem, but to do what? Wait. How many of us just love waiting? How many of us are, will admit, that you're impatient. I think most of us are. We want what we want and we want it now. But is there a benefit? We've been waiting a lot this past year, have we not? 
maybe even seems longer than it really was. But in that time, as our heads have been in whatever clouds we allow them to be, not being able to be out and about there, but as we reemerge and are able to re-engage with God and with each other, what is it that God wants us really to focus on? Someone wrote it this way, we are born here and given a vocation, speaking of here, not just in this space, but here on earth. We are born here and given a vocation here on earth, and that calling is not to always be gazing into heaven, indifferent to the injustices and needs of our neighbors, but to be busy sharing and being good news to humanity. We might also ask, what is it as we've been looking around, as we've been waiting, as we look down and look around, what is it that we have missed or what is it that we have lost over or what is it that we have seen and felt powerless to do anything about. Let us be reminded as we move toward Pentecost that it is the power of God's Holy Spirit in you and I that allows us to be a viable, visible, vocal presence now in the time that we live. Maybe they were looking for Jesus. Maybe the question is, are we looking for Jesus where Jesus was rather than where Jesus is? The Brennan Center for Justice says that 253 voter suppression bills in 43 states have already been introduced this year. That's six times higher than last year. More than 250 anti-LGBTQ bills have been introduced in the state legislatures in 2021, including at least 35 bills that would prohibit transgender youth from being able to access best practice, age-appropriate, gender-affirming medical care. So far in 2021, eight anti-LGBTQ bills have already been enacted into law and another 10 are already on governor's desk awaiting signatures. This is poised and puts us in a position to surpass 2015 as the worst year for anti-LGBTQ legislation in recent history. Someone else wrote this, it's no coincidence that the average lifespan of a trans woman of color is 35 years and there's been a 266% increase in trans murders already in 2021. LGBTQ youth plus youth are 120% more likely to experience homelessness. And one in two black trans people have been incarcerated and one in three black trans youth has tried to take her life in the last year. Have we seen this? Have we been looking elsewhere? Or have we seen it and just felt powerless to do something? May we connect and may our next part of the journey be part that connects us with God's Spirit in a way that puts some fire in us. That puts some fire from the tip of our toes to the top of our head. And I don't mean just being burned up physically. I mean that God's Spirit transforms us in a way, opens our eyes, our ears, our hearts to the depth of our souls that we can be God's voice, that we can be God's presence, and we can have the compassion and find, again, I don't like to let our compassion get too far ahead of our passion, but let's find the passion, the compassion, and the passion that helps follow through on it. It's easy for us to say, oh, let's do something about this, but do we follow through? Sometimes the follow through is the most challenging part for us. So they were told to wait. They were told not to look up, but to look around. And they were told to wait for the Holy Spirit. And so they walked back to Jerusalem. As you and I walk back over the next few weeks and months, as we walk back together, may this be our prayer. Oh, Lord, as we walk back to new life, oh, Lord, nudge us in the right direction And in our walk back to Jerusalem or to new life or to wherever it is that we're called, may we find the attention, the energy, the efforts not to be drawn to those things which distract, divide, divert, or delay us. But may we, O Lord, be about all that you call us to be and to be about doing in your name and in your spirit. The Lord is with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks and praise. It is right indeed, O Lord, to give you thanks and praise. And so we lift our voices with all the saints and angels and proclaim your glory in unending praise as we praise together, saying...
this gracious God, our creator, our savior, our sustainer in the Holy Spirit. Pour out your spirit upon us and in and through these gifts today. May we receive from you anew and afresh as we look for new life, as we look for new beginnings, as you regather us, center us on what's important. We come humbly confessing those things in our lives that we need your help to continue to be better at. We come also professing you as Lord. It's in your holy and precious name that we ask these things. Amen. Jesus took the bread from that Passover table and blessed it and broke it and said, this is my body. It represents my body broken. It represents my body open to you. As often as you receive it, you receive me. In the same way, he took the cup, poured it, and blessed it, and said, this is the new covenant. It is mercy. It is grace. It is forgiveness. It's not held back. All you have to do is receive it. It is for you, and for you, for you, and you, and you. It is for all of you. Will you say it with me? It is for me. Look around and say to someone else close by or send a text or an email and say, God's loved you too. Today we proclaim the great miracle and mystery of our faith. Christ, Christ has died, Christ, Christ is risen, and Christ, Christ shall come again. Hallelujah. My brothers and sisters, children of God, all of you, I invite you, whether you're here as part of our worship team, whether at home by yourself or with family or friends, or even if you're in the parking lot of Walmart right now, <laughs> grab something, a cookie or a cracker or a candy bar or something, doesn't matter what, it's about the symbolism of God's presence in your life, that God loves you. Grab a cup of water or juice or wine, whatever. I invite you, I'm going to invite our worship team to share, and then we will share together.
the body of Christ, may we share together. Cup of salvation. I invite you to sing with us as we sing the prayer that our Lord taught us to pray. closing song today. Well, yes, maybe there are times that we feel like that Jesus has been hidden from us. Again, I don't think God is trying to play some cosmic shell game of now you see me, now you don't. I don't even think God's trying to punish or teach us lessons playing some spiritual version of whack a -mole. And if you think about that, I just don't see that image of God. I see the image of God that is there waiting. Yes, wants us to look around and be Christ's presence as we are able to do with Christ's spirit touching our spirit. May that be our challenge as we move ahead. Thank you for joining us for worship. God bless you, my friends. We look forward to seeing you at the Congregational Forum at 1230 on Zoom and also sharing worship and the other opportunities that you have throughout the week to connect as well. God bless you and thank you for joining us for worship today.